Hey everyone, welcome back to the Virtual Eclipse Community Meetup. I'm your host, Stephanie Swor, and today I'm joined by Sven and Anton from Typefox, who will be showcasing Eclipse Thea, Cloud and Desktop IDE. So without further ado, guys, take it away. Thanks. Um, okay, I need to share the screen somehow. There. Is that the plan? Would I do it like that? Yeah. Let's yeah. <laughs> So welcome, everyone. Um, so my I'm Sven, um, uh, co-founder of Typefox. Yeah, I'm Tom. I'm working with you, Sven, on Thea uh, and Typefox. Yeah, and we, we are uh, pleased to talk about Thea today. Um, it's going to be roughly 30 to 40 minutes. Um, we will show a demo, some of the architectural ideas and so on, and then have some time left maybe for questions. So if you have questions, I'm not sure if any said that already, please um, put them somewhere in the chat or so, and then uh, we can address them at the end. Uh, so I guess it's the first question whenever you come to the idea to create another IDE is why would you do that? Um, and uh, we have many good reasons, but coming from an Eclipse background and also talking uh, to an Eclipse cloud today, um, I want to take this angle. So we've been developing Eclipse application based on a classic Eclipse IDE, classic Eclipse RCP for 10 years or so, um, helping people to build IDE-like applications. And, and they really use the composability that, that the plugin system in Eclipse um, provides. So you can really put stuff together that, and, and add your own extensions and plugins and, and that was really useful. And, and so there was a lot of um, concern in the recent years when we talked to our clients that, well, um, SWT has not been improved or maintained for so long. Um, What's, what's next? And there were a lot of efforts. Uh, you, you might have heard about that. So the first, I think, there was RAP that directly translates all the SWT code to JavaScript, to a JavaScript front-end client. Then there were um, attempts to re-render SWT with JavaFX or um, I think OpenGL as well. So all these kind of attempts, I would say, more or less, tried to solve this issue, with, but didn't really succeed. Because in the end, you would end up with your same Java code, with SWT APIs and so on. And so we had similar issues with our plans. Uh, of course, it's also very important that it's open source. And then there were a lot of clients that were also asking about, can you also run this in browsers, maybe? Right? And then um, Typefox is specialized on tools. so. We had to tell them, well, you can do either this or the other. Uh, so you would do an Eclipse application or IntelliJ or what, what not, or you use something like Eclipse J. Um, and the browser stuff is quite interesting and becomes more interesting. So, so we think this is really important for the future. Uh, there are several advantages to going into the cloud with browsers. Uh, I want to go quickly over those. Um, one is scalability, obviously. You can just create uh, or use machines in the cloud that are faster than your laptop. You can run multiple builds in parallel. Uh, I often do that, so I have really kind of looking at different PRs in parallel. I, I run the tests in parallel and so on, and the, all that in cloud development uh, workspaces, so it's not heating up my machine. It's not, yeah, it's not really disturbing me. Um, when you are doing data science, you need a lot of memory, obviously. And also, on the other side, you can do development on very cheap devices, because all you need is a browser. The automation part is even cooler, I would say. 
Uh, you can do that with local uh, desktop development, of course, but here it, it kind of comes very naturally that when you are working in workspaces and you have to describe what kind of Linux system you need, and you do that in, in, in a Docker file or a Docker image. That makes onboarding of team members very easy. Um, so you don't need to configure all the things. You can switch between different branches and, and time and so on, on on the same project. If you have checked in the Docker files and the configuration, everything is automated. And some other advantages are um, it, when you build an application and you use web technology, it's it's likely there is something that is very close to what you need already in MPNJS or um, yeah available open source. So there is a lot of stuff that you can reuse, much, much more than what exists in, on SWT or JFACE. Um, as a user, it's easier to do collaborative editing or shared workspaces because you just basically have to share a link and, and your colleague can open it in a browser and then you can look at the same situation uh, um, with two developers or more. And the security is also easier, especially if you are in a large um, company. You have situations where it's really hard to get um, access to an internal repository. I, I've seen plans where you, you actually have to get a notebook from that company, which is um, really kind of a long process. It's not about the money, but it's really the long process that is, is, is so painful. In, in order to allowing an external to, to, to work with you. And if you have one way to share code, and that is through HTTPS and everything is secure there, it's not automatically secure, but you have this one way, and it's easier to secure that. Obviously, there are downsides. Um, you need a network connection, actually a good one. This is really helpful. Uh, you have to take care of cost uh, in, in cloud computing, but I think that is not like compared to what engineering time costs. It's it's uh, not so important. There are like, latency issues with network connections. There are some parts of an IDE need to really be kind of instant. Uh, most important, I would say, is content assist. So you are in file and a large file and you need to press control space and then you want to immediately um, get the proposals. So the technology we use in Thea is, is quite fast and then we have the round trip for the network that, that is on top of that. I A month ago I measured, for instance, I was in Stockholm and I measured uh, with the Google Cloud instance running in Belgium, and it was 45 milliseconds. Um, uh, and I, like, I sent the proposals, and I got the proposals back in 45 milliseconds, basically. So that's fine in many in, in many situations, but of course it adds a bit. So and therefore, it is important to support, uh, support both, and that's why VR is um, aiming at that. And I think that's a lot of um, stuff in the beginning. We want to show you what it FIA does. OK. So actually, FIA allows you to run application in the browser and on desktop. So I'm going to show you two applications. First one is a browser. So you see here, here in the browser, um, it's a um, I found a project on GitHub with Hello World Shielded. So you, you can see on the left hand side and sidebar Hello World Shielded project with some files. We can open some files. Let's say edit me empty. And uh, we open the markdown files by default in uh, preview mode. So what this project allows you to do is um, in Hello World, we are servlet, and we need first to start a checking server with that servlet. I will use a common palette. This common palette is a very useful UI element in FIA, where you can find all commands which are registered. So here we can find, for example, and let's do change color thing, so I can change 
light or dark. I will continue with dark because I like it more. And then we can create, uh, sorry, we can create a new program now. And then we, we see that here's a terminal which opens in our project directory. We can look what kind of files are there. We also can copy this command, paste it here, and start JT server. Okay, while JT server is starting, we can have a look at our uh, hello world server. So I will use another, I will use command palette again, but not command, but quick palette to find files. So it showed me all files in my workspace. I can fit them down. If I fit it down to Java files, it's hello server Java. And we get our editor. So in FIA, we use a lot of things, and uh, there's two important components which we use from VS Code. One is Monaco user. You can see it here. And another is uh, language show protocol. So language show protocol allows uh, decouple tool like editor from uh, the language markers. So for example, in Eclipse, we run GPT builder inside Eclipse. In our case, we run uh, Language server for Java, which is developed by Red Hat in a separate process, a Java process. And then we talk to it via LSP. So this language server provides us all smartest. Like, for example, it shows me what kind of symbols I have. I can navigate it here. Whenever I hover over some um, symbols, it provides me information about hover. I can navigate to these symbols, look what kind of methods they have. Um, yeah, look up references. So, for example, HTTP servlet has two references in Hello World, in Hello servlet, because we implemented. Yeah. Um, so, our server already started. You can see it here in the terminal, and I can copy the link, and we just go and check that it actually works. Okay. So, the nice thing about uh, this JT is that it automatically recompiles whenever I'm we change the code, so we can try to change some code here. I will open the progress view so that you see how the language server reports new problems whenever I type. I will just report as a um, message. Let's get writer, print the land. Let's uh, uh, hide for example. And so you can see it reports errors, I can navigate them. We can see them also in a navigator. Uh, error markers. We also see markers from the git, so the file has been modified. So if we fix the error, uh, there's also some unused import. We can use quick fixes, which also provided with our language server, apply them, change the code, save it. Problems again, JT recompiled, so we can refresh the page yeah, and it's high then. Okay, what else? We have in Git, uh, in VM, it's like whenever you use changes, you probably want to commit them. So we can go to Git view, and here it shows you changes which you have made. You can select them and preview in Git view. So we remove this print writer, we change duplicate body. Now we can stage them, give some uh, commit message. We changed things, message, and we can commit them. Then there is also a git history view, which shows you the whole git history, like what kind of means it will be. We can preview, look at files that have been changed again, open with changes, and so on. Another nice and useful feature is search. So, like when you want to look up some occurrences of text in the in the your workspace, and as you type. You see it gets filtered down, you can then remove some occurrences and I don't know, replace them with hello too. Okay, and see it get um, replaced. So it's how FIA looks in the browser. As I said, you also can run it as a desktop application, and I will show you another application which is called Youngster. Okay, let's switch to Electron. Uh, you see, it looks uh, very similar. I just used another color theme, white. A lot important with uh, desktop applications that you can use all the native elements. So whenever I open context menu, it's a native context menu, or you, you have the native top level menus. What's interesting about Youngster, we, so 
we integrated it with Young Language Server, which is implemented with Xtext for Node. And the second we use a technology which is called Sprout. It's a new generation diagramming framework, which also supports client server infrastructures. So it uh, runs, uh, it extends Xtext language server, accessing semantic mod model and creates its um, diagram from it. And then it sends uh, this diagram model to the front end that it can be displayed. So for example, we can open Young diagram for this file, and you see it. It it, it renders diagram for, for this file. I'm not sure what it does actually, but <laughs> yeah. anyway, also it's automatically synced. So whenever we select some element here, you see it's selected in the file, and it's other way around also. So I can select another one. Yeah, I can uh, probably change something, and it should be automatically selected. Not sure. Um, yeah, have this maybe, maybe just remove it. So we have this really, and then this maybe, yes, no. Oh, sorry. So maybe, can I move it? So it throws automatically the other yard. Uh, so it goes in another place, but you see that maybe a branch is removed. A spread is based on Elk, the layout and framework. Okay. So I think it's enough for Dima, and we can go back to slides and look what is the scope of here. So first, uh, we want to support desktop and browsers application, but the important point for us is that it should be single sourcing. So you write one code, and then you run it it's in, in desktop and browser. So if, for example, you can start it just with desktop application, and so later when you want to go to browser, you use exactly the same code in the, in the browser. Um, the second, uh, we want to support uh, extensions very nicely, similar like it's an Eclipse FCP, so even core of here is an extension, and all extensions can contribute some services, they can consume services, and they can also rebind them, so like you can contribute extensions which even change some core services and completely white label your products, so they have your own branding and so on. So it's, it's a very flexible architecture. And we also want to support modern technologies. So like um, like when there are more new tools and uh, new web technologies, we want to be able to catch up very fast and be able to use them. So how do we achieve it? That we follow two principles. First one is we reuse it. We try to reuse as much as possible. But it makes sense because we don't want to implement as a whole idea ourselves. So first of all, it's obviously we use language server and debug adapter protocol. Um, I think language server protocols already supports about 60 languages, and you possibly can run all these languages in um, in here. It's, it's similar to something like the debug adapter protocol. We, we, want, we want to use as much as possible web technologies, and so on, if, on core level, we actually we don't decide for some framework like React or Angular. We use a uh, pretty standard DOM, and then extensions can uh, choose whatever technology they want to pick. And then we try to use command line tools, meaning that we don't really build wizards around that. And uh, the, the issue is that whenever you build a wizard and command line tools improve, like uh, compilers and so on, you always have to catch up with them. So users usually have to use terminals. Yeah. So in that case, it's less is more like we use the standard technologies, like the st uh, standard web technologies and command line tools, and we're able to catch up really fast. So how are we able to deploy uh, web-based uh, application in a desktop? We use uh, Electron. Electron was developed by GitHub uh, for Atom. And what it allows you, it takes standard web technologies like JavaScript, HTML, CSS, TypeScript, and puts them, uh, runs them as a native, web, uh, native desktop application. Okay, to, to realize, you can think about here like two applications. One application is a web server, which runs on backend, and it has access to file system and it can start different processes like language servers or file system watching and so on. But uh, the point is that they live very close to file system and can 
have fast access to it. And then it's also sort of a front-end application, which is web application. And they talk between each other via JSON RPC protocols. So in cloud case, for example, you can put it backend in the Docker, deploy it in some cloud service like uh, Google Cloud or Amazon, and then it will source your front-end application which you open in, the, in the, your browser. In Electron case, we run everything from your desktop in the Electron processes, and from front end is uh, running Chromium. So, but you also can combine uh, these approaches. The, the important point is that actually, fear it's it's a single user, so each user gets their own backend. But uh, in theory, backend can be shared. So, if I have some issues uh, working on some project, I can uh, get a link to my backend, give it to Sven, and Sven will open it. And then backend can be, like, for example, in Docker, but Sven can open in in uh, Electron. Yeah, that's good. Um, so I think that's it about uh, architecture. And so we will continue. All right. So Anton already mentioned that you can run via in Docker and Kubernetes. So I'm talking now about not the desktop uh, hosting, of course, because that's that's a no-brainer. But how do do we do uh, cloud IDs? So one option is you just run it on some Docker container and you make sure. Maintain it yourself, how you start a workspace, stop a workspace, and so on. Another option is using Eclipse J. Um, some of you might know it, uh, especially because we are talking to an Eclipse cloud here. Uh, it used to have a workspace, I mean, to still today, it, it, it is two things it is a workspace server and an IDE. So the workspace server is the thing that gives you kind of the multi-user part and the idea that you, as a user, have a kind of a lot of workspaces that you can start and stop and configure, and you have to, you can maintain it with something called a dashboard that gives you all kinds of options um, for for starting, stopping, maintaining, configuring workspaces. And then when you are running a container or a workspace, then you are looking at the IDE. That is the thing that the now replaces and and the cool part is that Eclipse Shade uh, now opens up this part, so they concentrate on the workspace server and make it uh, possible to run other web IDEs in, in Shade. So you can run Thea, and, and they, um, they want to make that the primary kind of um, default IDE, but also other IDEs, as I understood. So there are other kind of things, like Jupyter Lab, if you know that, it's from, from the um, IPython um, folks, so it's a data science ID, and that makes a lot of sense to, to, to um, split this up. Um, this is kind of, I think, for later this year, if I am not mistaken. Um, another option that I want to talk about today is um, something we call Gitpod, which is um, a small, kind of nice uh, um, way to, to run IDEs that, that we've built. The idea is that uh, GitHub is your dashboard. So there is no, no dashboard in, in, in GitHub that where you have to configure workspaces and start and stop and so on there. Instead, what you do is you just go to GitHub and you get a button. You can see it here. And you just click it. And then you can start coding. So it's really like we, we try to get this in-between maintenance thing of cloud workspace out of the way and just kind of give you a very, very um, neat experience from code in the web to running and, and, and coding, so to say, running the code and coding. And what's special here as well is that it's very contextual. So on GitHub, you have many different things you might want to do. So here, I was on a pull request. And when you start a GitHub from there, the 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 ID will open in 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 the pull request or code review mode. So you see all the changes of that code, of that pull request, and can see and go through them in in seeing the diff uh, editor. And so basically, doing the same that you can do on GitHub. But since we are in an IDE here, we can also 
just run the code. So you see on the right hand side, this is an embedded application browser that shows the code. And as we change, for instance, here the color, it turns from purple to green. So in a review, I can really execute the changes and see whether they actually work. I can have tests and, and all these things. And once I'm happy with that, you see the icon on, on the left hand side in the editor, I can in the IDE put comments in. So I would just say, well, um, what I think about the change, and I can start the review and have many of these kind of um, comments. There is a special pull request view in, in GitHub workspaces where you can um, just see all what happens in the code review and you can prove or merge or whatever. And of course, everything you do there serves automatically with, with GitHub as, as, you, as you do and in most ways. So that's really not meant as like classic cloud IDEs um, that, that replace your local development um, environment, but it's more like an extension to GitHub. You go on GitHub and there are these small things you want to do. You just want to do a bit more than what GitHub allows you to do with just editing one file. You want to really code a bit more, do a small um, pull request, you can create one, or you do a code review that is deeper than what you do on, on GitHub. So that's the idea. Uh, the, the GitHub still needs to know some information in order to start a, a really good, well-working workspace. So um, information you can provide is, is done in, in the root project or, or like in something like .gitpod files that you put into the root of the project. And what you can configure there is, for instance, the Docker image. So you say, um, I, I need these and that tools for development, and so you add them there, and then it, they will automatically be there whenever you start a Git pod from any situation in that project, any branch or any issue. Actually, when you start a Git pod from an issue, it automatically kind of puts you into the, ah, oh, you, you're going to fix this issue mode, so to say. Um, other things like exposed ports can be configured, start scripts. So when you start a, a Git pod workspace, it will automatically start the build if, if you configure it like that. Um, Thea extensions will soon be available. So you can say, I need this special extension here. And then some other things like what kind of extra project you want to check out or what, what is the root and, and, and so on. This git pod file might sit in the root of the project, as I mentioned. That's, a, that's the best and primary thing uh, where we would look for it. If, it. if there's none there, there is a general repository where you can put them. Uh, it's definitely GP. It's allowed to definitely type it for TypeScript, so you have external .git pod files for repositories there. And then the third option is that we just infer it. We, we, we look at the content and we guess, so, oh, there is a yarn log, probably use yarn, or a pom XML, probably you need Maven, and, and such things. And uh, you saw this GitHub button. Of course, GitHub doesn't have this button yet. Um, it is it's coming through a browser extension. And if you don't want to install a browser extension, what you also can do is just go to any URL and prefix it with skippod.io hash. And then that's just actually what the button does. It's only prefixing the URL with skippod.io hash. And from that URL, uh, it put in first the full context and does its thing. Right, a uh, brief recap. Um, as of now, it, it focuses on GitHub, but we are working on support for GitLab and Bitbucket as well. It has really nice integrated code review um, features. Yeah, we uh, have running in the cloud on gitpod.io, but also provided on on-prem on installation. And it will be very soon in public beta. So currently it's private beta, so you can go on the website and, and request an invite. And but very soon it will be public for everyone. Okay, back to Thea. Of course, I, I, would, I don't have to say that most of what you saw in GitHub is the uh, Thea and is the, the open source part on which we've been working since more than one year, I, I think. 
So that's all open source. And we keep uh, all the general stuff being open source. So what, uh, what is going to happen in the next time is um, like we are working on migrating the widgets you saw to use React. It's more like an internal cosmetic thing, but we were starting out with another library and things. Since React is more mainstream, we thought it's important to migrate there and be, be kind of a good example on how to build a complex widget for theme. Um, the Eclipse Shade people, specifically um, developers from Red Hat, are working on support for the debug adapter protocol, which will, I hope, also be ready this year. And it's, it looks quite well already cool um, and also they have a lot of experience with implementing and debugging because they did that already for the JIDE so um, that should be quite nice. Another thing they are working on is the new plugin system. So far what, what, what we talked about is um, the what we call extensions in Thea. And extensions are more or less compile time. They give you all the um, flexibility and power that you also see with Eclipse plugins, actually a bit more even. Uh, so you can really access all APIs and everything within the is built with, based on these extensions. The problem with that power is also that you can screw up an installation easily with, with bad version ranges and so on. We all know this problems um, from Eclipse. So what we want to have in addition to this extension system is a plugin system that is does more a sandbox approach. Um, so it's similar to VS Code and actually in the long run should fully support the VS Code extension API. So um, the people working on it really um, look at the VS Code API and try to develop it step by step towards that that's in the end um, supported ideally. And so, yeah, I think the bottom line is, uh, I mean, for sure, it's really cool to support VS Code Action. That's super awesome. But what's also cool about this is it, you have this um, sandbox, so nothing can screw up your IDE that you install through these plugins. And but on the on the downside, you also can't really do very like the things you would do with extensions. So if you are building a product based on the AI, you're better off with extensions. If you want to just to add a handy command or a bit of language support here and there, um, stuff that people can do with VS Code also, then um, the new plugin system is for you. And furthermore, we are working on LSP enhancements or language server protocol. It is this this uh, set of features, editing features for languages that is um, so far defined by Microsoft in, in, as part of the VS Code project. It is um, now adopted in, in all kinds of IDEs and language supports. And it lacks a couple of features that especially we from the Eclipse community or from the Java community are missing. So stuff like call hierarchy or semantic coloring, um, and so those two features, for instance, are on the list. We are working on them. And also a, a proper outline and a proper type part here are on the list. And, and then besides those four bigger topics, there are many other also big or small features that um, the Thea core team is working on. The Thea core team consists of members from Ericsson, Typefox and Red Hat, and now also um, people from ARM coming in and some individuals. So it's really a growing community, and we are very happy with every new face we see there. So if you just if you're interested, um, go to the GitHub repository, and 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 you can even also start chatting on, on Garrett. We have a Garrett link and and, and so forth. Um, so these are the two websites of the projects uh, we've been talking about, and now we have some time left for questions.
So at this moment in time, it doesn't look like we have any questions. So I'd like to say thanks to Sven and Anton for a fantastic presentation and to the community for tuning in. Um, so if anybody does have any questions after uh, the YouTube live stream is over, feel free to leave them on our YouTube comment section, our Twitter feed, or the Virtual Eclipse Community Meetup Meetup page. Um, so Sven, Anton, thanks again. Uh, and we will see everybody on July 18th for our next Virtual Eclipse Community Meetup, uh, developing in the cloud modeling. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye, friends. Bye-bye.